Evolution is a fact. It's a fact which is established as securely as essentially any other fact that we have in science. Richard Dawkins is so confident that evolution is a fact and that therefore God doesn't exist that he has devoted his entire life to spreading the evolution gospel. I'm an atheist with respect to the Judeo-Christian God because there is not a shred of evidence in favor of the Judeo-Christian God. As you know, there's a, there's a problem with American education that some nutcases are trying to introduce creationism into American schools, which is obviously very bad for science, and my scientific colleagues are deeply worried by this and are trying to fight it and all power to them. And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. When Richard Dawkins confidently proclaims that evolution is a fact, he means that Darwin's theory and origin of the species is a fact. But is it a fact or is it a series of assumptions already falsified by much of the scientific community? that and more on today's edition of Everyday Faith I Gathering. Darwinian assumptions of evolution are contemptuously proclaimed in classrooms and lecture halls today. But what is proudly proclaimed as scientific fact is largely based on predetermined assumptions, not scientifically proven fact. More on that in a moment, but the modern-day new atheism has taken their assumptions to a new caustic level. The last clip in our intro was a pronouncement made by the late Christopher Hitchens, one of the forerunners of new atheism. A book that he wrote selling millions of copies is titled, God is Not Good, and Why Religion Poisons Everything. What you may not realize is that his brother Peter Hitchens was once just as arrogant as his brother on the side of atheism. However, something radically changed. Peter Hitchens is today a radically born-again Christian. Here's his testimony. I grew up in a standard English middle-class home, as I think was quite common at the time, where there probably wasn't very much discussion of religion. There was quite a lot of religion at school, but I don't recall it ever coming up at home, and I don't think we would, for instance, generally go to church during the school holidays. But on the other hand, we would have religious services every day at school. The formal renunciation, the Bible burning incident, I suppose I must have been 15. It's a moment when you start wanting to be separate from your parents, and therefore you separate yourself, of course, from a lot of the things that your parents stand for or you think they stand for and from in my case most of the adults who not until then influenced your life so i had my life taken up with a pretty detailed and demanding secular faith uh, i didn't have any shortage of things to believe in and then after that i tried as many former marxists do to make my peace with a world which i increasingly realized didn't need to be overthrown by revolution. Well, I was originally a journalist because I was a revolutionary socialist and I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to serve the cause of the revolution by, uh, by getting into journalism and using my position in, uh, in newspapers to promote the revolutionary cause. And then I changed my mind. I think it's important to say that atheism led me to faith because so many people view atheism as the final station on the railroad. That you arrive there, that you've been through everything else, that the argument is finished and that you have permanently rejected something which is restricted really to the childhood of mankind. You can actually see from where I sit that far from being the end of the argument, it's the beginning of the argument. The story goes like this. There we were, a good lunch inside us, my then girlfriend, now my wife and I, wandering around the lovely town of Beaune in the middle of Burgundy in France. Looked at the guidebook and it recommended particularly a work of art. Went to look at it thinking, oh, another religious painting. And it was a painting of The Last Judgment by a man called Roger van der Weyden. And to my astonishment, the layers of 
time and distance which normally lie over old paintings were stripped away because the people in it were actually people just like me and the people I knew. And the shock of seeing this plunged me into a whole train of thought from which I have yet to escape. That is to say, the realization of something that I'd always been taught and had for many years rejected, that I might myself be judged. I lived in the dying years of the Soviet Union in Moscow. I traveled extensively in the regions run by communism. I saw it, and I know how very, very hostile it was to religion and why it was. And one of the things I want to communicate to people is how that hostility is now being reforged by new atheists who in many cases have no idea of the forces they're trying to summon out of the ground and very little idea of the dangers of what they're doing. If you drive God out of the world, then you create a howling wilderness. There is, as it were, a Hitchens brand. Brothers and brothers, you, are, you got them whether you want to have them or not. My poor father tried to get us to sign a peace treaty. This book has come about because my brother wrote a book attacking God and Christianity and religion in general. There is an argument to be had. There are things that he says that are wrong. If he wants to write about Henry Kissinger, then that's fine by me. I don't know or actually care very much about Henry Kissinger. But he doesn't know any more about God than I do. Thinking what I think and believing what I believe, that I would hope that my brother would change his mind. I make very limited claims for myself. I travel the world. I try and keep up with events. If somebody says, have you read such and such, and I haven't, I'll say, no, I haven't read it. I would think that most educated atheists are much more likely to be suddenly ambushed in the heart by poetry than they ever are likely to be converted by reasoned argument. A lot of what is, uh, of what is conveyed by Christianity has to be conveyed in this form because, because words, even the most beautiful words, can't fully convey it. The arts, which have always had most effect on me, these things are, are, are immensely potent. I think that, that if people are exposed to them, then they may find that the, uh, the still small voice is audible. Peter Hitchens book is entitled Rage Against God, How Atheism Led Me to Faith. Now, correction on the title I earlier gave to the late Christopher Hitchens' book. I said that it was entitled, God is Not Good. Actually, the title is, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. In Peter's testimony, he clearly stated that the still, small voice can still be heard. But like with him, he doesn't believe it will happen through rational intellectual arguments. The way that we have been expressing that is vital, and that is what is behind the intellectual arguments. It must be an inner revelation if a person is ever going to come to the truth. And that, of course, doesn't mean that we stick our heads in the sand and forget how to think. That is not God-honoring, and it's self-defeating, really, for faith. However, what we are attempting to do is expose the flaws in atheistic thought and new atheism's motivations, and that is an entirely different matter. So what we are going to do now is, just for a few minutes, we're, we're going to give space for you to pray for your own confidence that comes with your mind being inspired with your spirit and also to pray right now for someone you know that is a skeptic an atheist or an agnostic appeal to the lord in this moment on their behalf that they will have appointments in their day that are god designed to open the eyes of their hearts let's do that now let's pray
And now we continue, and we want to unmask the lie that all agnostics and atheists are in agreement on this issue of evolution. In our intro, you heard Richard Dawkins proclaim that he and his colleagues were highly disturbed by the moronish attempt to teach creation in the schools. His implication by using the words, his colleagues, is that there is an agreement with him in the scientific community, and that is not simply totally true. There is some, but not all. Let's listen to David Berlinski, a noted agnostic mathematician, as he responds to the Darwinian philosophy. We're dealing with a collection of anecdotes, a, a certain point of view, a series of hunches. Um, I would say that the, the most outstanding, the salient points are, first of all, the fossil record. Uh, which is which is simply mystifying. We can't make much sense of the fossil record. It does not sustain any kind of Darwinian prediction that can be intelligently derived from Darwinian theory, and it doesn't seem to sustain anything else as far as I can see. It's it's a, a perfectly mystifying record. That's one obvious point. I'm not talking just about the Cambrian explosion. I'm talking about everything that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the fossil record. Second point, uh, we have never been able in any way theoretically to examine the central Darwinian claim that natural selection and random variation can account for a great deal of complexity. If you look at the history of physics, for example, what did Newton do in the 17th century? He said, well, the planets are being attracted to the sun by a force. It's not any kind of force. It's an inverse square force. And then he went and showed that if you make that assumption, the result will be an orbit that conforms exactly to the observed orbit, say, of the, of the Earth or of Mars. It will be a conic section. And then he proved the converse, that if it's a conic section, the planets must be attracted to a central source by an inverse square law. There is nothing like that in biology, in Darwinian theory. A kind of a, a canonical demonstration that this mechanism, random variation, natural selection, is adequate to the generation of this level of complexity from the point of view of the serious sciences, without that kind of a demonstration, one is completely adrift. You have no idea whether the mechanism is adequate for its intended purposes. This is the second point. Third evidential piece of the puzzle. Look, you turn to the serious sciences, you turn to general relativity or quantum mechanics. I can program a computer with the equations of general relativity or with the equations of quantum mechanics and I can say, all right, what are the consequences? I can actually see the consequences uh, emerge in a simulation. We can't do any of this in biology. And that, that should, should prompt any reasonable person to ask, why not? If this is such a simple mechanism, which could easily be programmed on a computer, how come we can't set up a computer and create something of biological-like complexity? How come we cannot see the unfolding of an evolutionary process the way we can see the unfolding of an evolutionary process in physics? This is a very serious question. I've looked at all the genetic algorithms. I'm trying to write a genetic algorithm myself. And, uh, and the sheer fact is, uh, without a tremendous amount of very special man manipulation and ad hoc constraints, the computer is not going to generate anything realistic if it uses Darwinian mechanisms. And it will generate something realistic only if it doesn't use Darwinian mechanisms. This is an important point. Um, 50 years after the computer revolution began, we have a splendid tool for ex assessing the, um, the intelligibility and viability of Darwinian theory. And everything that we know, everything we, that we know, and I think this is the uniform experience of anyone working in genetic algorithms, indicates these mechanisms will not work. They will not work for their intended purposes. And finally, there's the utter absence of laboratory evidence. I mean, random variation, natural selection, we should be able to start manipulating organisms. When we look at dogs, no matter how far back we go, it's dogs. When we look at bacteria, no matter what we do, they stay bugs. They don't change in their fundamental nature. There seems to be some sort of an inherent species limitation, and we have no good explanation for this in terms of Darwinian theory. We should have far more flexibility, far more plasticity under laboratory conditions than we actually do if Darwinian theory or anything like that were correct. What we see in nature, what we see in the laboratory, is very highly bounded variation, cyclic variation, as, for example, bin, um, uh, finch beaks in the Galap uh, Galapagos Island. That's about all we see. Small variations. Why is that if Darwinian theory is correct? 
These are evidentiary points that I think need to be stressed, need to be examined openly, honestly. And they never are, of course. Never are. Well, if I'm out of my element, then uh, Charles Darwin must also have been out of his element because his uh, training was in uh, medicine and uh, theology, although he was, in fact, a very good scientist, uh, self-taught, a gentleman amateur like others of his time. Charles Lyell, the father of modern geology, was a lawyer. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the thing about Darwinian evolution today is that it is a general philosophical concept that connects many disparate fields of science. So that you see, uh, molecular biologists, for example, are relying on fossil experts, paleontologists, and vice versa. And then they're all relying on geneticists. And each one of these groups of scientists outside their own element is just a generalist, is just a, a layman like, like anyone else. Uh, so there aren't really any specialists in evolution. It's a generalist's country. What a lawyer brings to this, or an academic lawyer who is uh, philosophically oriented, is a nose for the, the assumptions, the patterns of thinking, the things that, as members of a particular professional culture, the, the people just take for granted and never question. Uh, for example, one of those things is the creative power of natural selection. If you ask these people, how do you know that mutation and selection, the Darwinian mechanisms, have the power to create complex organs, the answer will, they give will be some variation on, well, everybody knows that. That's common knowledge. We settled that long ago. All of these things that say, we've just decided not to think about that, but simply to assume it. So th that's what a lawyer brings to this, is the ability to recognize things like that and bring them out in the open. And that's, of course, why the outsider is so unpopular with the insiders. Because the outsider is saying, look, uh, here's where you went wrong. This is the assumption you made that was never established, and that because you couldn't establish it, you agreed to treat it as a fact among yourselves, and then to use your authority to prevent anybody from criticizing it. Well, naturally, the professional group doesn't want to hear that. And so they hate outsiders, uh, as uh, they properly should, I, I suppose, because they, they blow the whistle on this. Um, the other thing to be said about the outsider uh, is that every one of the great authorities of Darwinism, from Charles Darwin and T.H. Huxley at the beginning, through Dobzhansky, Simpson, and Julian Huxley a generation ago, to Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins, and so on today, uh, is that every one of those authorities wrote books for the general public. They addressed the general public, and not a single one of them ever said, this evidence is inaccessible to you. Don't try to figure it out because you can't understand it. Indeed, the implied premise of all the books was, it's easily understood. And anyone who isn't completely prejudiced or ignorant can see that it's obviously true. So I like to think of myself as the reader for whom all those books were intended, and I'm speaking back to the authors and explaining to them what they overlooked. That in fact, their books are not convincing because they're assuming at the beginning of the inquiry the point that they claim to have demonstrated at the end, and so there's a thinking flaw. Um, so instead of responding to that, naturally they say, oh, why don't you shut up um, and leave us alone uh, so we can continue to get away with this. I hope that you've been receiving some benefit, some refreshed confidence from what you've been seeing today. From the standpoint of loving God with our minds as well as with our hearts. You know, I'd love to hear from you. All you need to do is email me at the address below, garyellis1244 at gmail.com. Tell me where you're viewing from, how this series is beneficial to you, and any questions that you may have, and suggestions for future broadcasts. We're going to be concluding today with a very helpful consideration of creation from the Genesis account by Professor John Lennox, born-again mathematics professor at Oxford. Truthfully, I personally found Professor Lennox's ability to present the Christian case in a very intelligent and understandable manner. In fact, I'd encourage you to discover his debates on YouTube as well as Googling Professor John Lennox for listings of his books. Here now is Professor John Lennox 
on the creation account in Genesis. Seven days that divide the world. How do you reconcile the description you find in the book of Genesis with what you know as a scientist? Well, you'd be amused to know, and I must confess it, Simon, that I come from the city in Northern Ireland called Armagh, where Archbishop Usher was, who calculated the date of creation uh, as 4004 BC. And you will remember that he said he reckoned that Adam was created about nine o'clock in the morning, but he apologized in a letter to Cambridge's vice chancellor that he couldn't be more accurate than that. So okay, well, what do you do the, with that? What do I do with it? Well, we start with in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And then there is a sequence of six days, and each of them begins with the phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said. And then after those six days of creation activity, God rests on the seventh day. Okay. Now, just looking at that, the first thing to notice is there is a literary pattern. One would logically conclude, I think, prima facie, that day one begins with, and God said. And that means that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth is not talking about day one, but is prior to day one. Now, instantly, you see, that removes the difficulty with people saying that the Bible insists the earth is young. The Bible doesn't insist the earth is young. It says, in the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say what that time that was at, and then it gives a sequence of creative acts of God, which we can discuss separately. And interestingly enough, when you check with the Hebrew scholars, they tell you that the tense changes from verses 1 and 2 to verse 3, and the tense that's used in verse 1 and 2 is normally the tense used to describe something that happens prior to the sequence that's following. So there's corroboration from both logic and grammar that perhaps this text is a little bit more sophisticated than people think it is. So you would take the approach then that there's a lot more going on in this text that yes. literally, so, so uh, from a literary basis, yes. which would indicate that it doesn't demand uh, a literal six days. Well, we have to look at this word literal, you know. Think of this statement. Jesus said, I am the door. Well, we don't understand that to mean that he was a door made of wood or metal or plastic. It's because of our experience of doors made of wood, metal and plastic, though, that we know it's meant at a metaphorical level. But careful, because the metaphor is a metaphor for something real. Jesus is a real door, not a literal door. Or you might say he is a literal door at a different level. That's why I find the word literal actually a bit unfortunate, and it's why many people use the word literalistic to describe that absolutely basic sort of literal flat level. Re the the, the, that's right, you see. Now, pursuing that, I would want to argue that the word day in Genesis 1 and 2 has four different meanings, and all of them are literal. Do you want me to prove that to sure. you? Well, take the first. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. How long is that? Well, it's certainly not 24 hours because the text is drawing your attention to the distinction between day and night. So that's the first meaning. It's the hours of daylight, roughly 12 at the equator. Okay, come to the next one. And there was evening and morning one day. Now, I know scholars discuss that a little bit, but it seems the consensus is generally that this is the Hebrew way of describing a full 24-hour period, okay? So that's meaning number two. Then we read God rested on the seventh day, but there's no formula, and there was evening and morning day seven. Now, that's interesting, as Augustine pointed out centuries ago. And if you ask people theologically what that means, there was a sequence of creative acts and God rested. When did he start creating again? He didn't. The rest is still going on. So that absence of the formula actually opens up a possibility into a theological dimension. So that's three meanings. Then you come to chapter 2 and the end of that first uh, section of Genesis where it says, um, when God created the heavens and the earth. But actually the word when, and that's the, I think the ESV translation, it's actually in the day God created. Now, that doesn't mean Tuesday or Monday or the first or all. 
No, it means when. Just as if I said to you in my young day at Cambridge, we had to wear gowns after dark. You wouldn't say, do you mean Sunday or Tuesday? No, it means that a particular period of time. Now, here's a compressed text, Simon. It uses the word day quite often. It uses it with arguably four different meanings. And that's an indicator to me that here we must be very careful before we jump to conclusions. It opens up more logical possibilities. The idea would then possibly be that God speaks day one, let there be light. And then that settles down and then God speaks again. When does he speak again? Well, presumably after the first time. But it seems to me that Scripture allows the possibility that there's an enormous space between the days. That is, they are the point, so to speak, where God inputs a new level of energy and information. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that would mean that so far as any evidence was left in the scientific investigation of the universe, we might expect to find the sudden appearance of new levels of complexity, which is what we do find. And I personally see no compromise with the authority of Scripture on this. But it is a big subject, and one needs to have much more time to unpack it. Well, well let's look at Genesis itself uh, then, and putting aside some of these uh, arguments. What are the key messages of Genesis, early chapters of Genesis, and why do they matter? Well, I like your question because the sad thing is with many people, they think that once they have come to a satisfactory for them understanding of the days of Genesis, they've understood Genesis. They haven't begun to understand Genesis. Genesis is utterly foundational to the theistic, the Judeo-Christian worldview. It tells us, first of all, that there was a beginning. It tells us that God was the beginner of everything. He is eternal. It tells us that God is not a force, he's a person. And it begins to build up a picture of the universe step by step. It tells us that God had a goal in building up the universe. His goal was to have human beings on it. And they are special. How are they special? They're made in God's image. The Bible is very careful to explain that although the heavens show the glory of God, they weren't made in his image. Human beings were, so they're the pinnacle of his creation. That immediately puts a stamp on their values. And it tells us he created them equal, male and female. That is an enormously important thing for the value of men and women in the contemporary world. We read of sin entering into the world. We read of the damage it does, the fracture between God and human beings. And because of that, we begin to understand why the way back must include where the fracture occurred. It, the fracture occurred because people couldn't trust God, so they have to learn to trust God again and how that's brought about. It's those things that are vastly important, much more important than the days of Genesis, if I might say so, because I notice that they are not mentioned in the New Testament at all. John Lennox, great chatting to you. Thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure. Next time, join us as we look at Jesus. Is he another myth that can only be verified through the Bible, as some claim? Join us on Everyday Faith Eye Gathering for Jesus, the complete evidence. Let me hear from you, and God bless you abundantly.